When a new technology with tremendous potential rolls out, expectations are sky high. It's going to be a magical technology that changes the world, right? And if it doesn't take off immediately with consumers, there can be a tendency to overreact, to be let down, to give up, and move on to the next new thing that's supposed to change the world. But what if the technology is augmented reality and it does truly change the way people see the world? Even though everyone isn't walking around every second using AR just yet, augmented reality has been making great strides over the last decade. And Peggy Johnson, the CEO of Magic Leap, explains that digital augmentation will be the norm eventually. There will be a time where we'll look back and say, remember when we didn't have digital augmentation in front of our eyes, whether that'll be in the form of glasses that we'll wear or contacts maybe at some point, I do believe we will have that kind of capability as a tool to help us just get through our days, do our jobs, and to entertain us. This is the start of it. The way to combat overreacting when a new technology is not immediately broadly used is to simply realize that it takes time to change the world. In particular, how people see the world. With augmented reality, the complex goal is to seamlessly integrate physical and digital spaces. That's a real challenge. Technological advancement of this magnitude takes patience, and there are always fits and starts, but it's happening right now. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Peggy shares the state of AR today and where she sees it heading in the future. She also explains how technological advancement has a trajectory that can sometimes be misunderstood. If a technology does not immediately take off with consumers, some mistakenly write it off as a failure. She also discusses the journey that Magic Leap has been through as a company, including how she's helped the company pivot from a consumer facing to a product that focuses solely on enterprise applications. Peggy clarifies that this is just part of the process as a powerful technology is often first directed towards consumers, then to enterprise, and then finally cycles back to consumers in a major way. Enjoy the episode. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have the CEO of Magic Leap, but she's not just the CEO. She's not only the Magic Leap CEO, she is also the owner of four dogs, three kids, two cats, and one husband. Best Twitter bio we've had in a while. Peggy Johnson, welcome to the show. Thanks, Albert. Thanks, uh, thanks for that intro. That pretty much sums me up right there. Well, I'd also take it that that's the order of importance, too. You got <laughs> the husband's at the tail end. That's okay. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that, but thank you. I, I, may, I might have to rethink that. <laughs> and also a runner. But, you know, Peggy, thanks for joining us today on the show. We always love having leaders in technology and innovation on IT Visionaries, of course. But before we begin, for anyone who doesn't know what Magic Leap is, could you fill our audience in? What is Magic Leap and what does it do? Sure, sure. We are an augmented reality platform. And essentially, we make a device. It's a head-worn device. And when you put it on, you still see your physical world but we overlay digital content in that world. And, it, and it, we, you know, it can be something up close on your desk, something across the room, and you can actually interact with that content. Uh, you can you know, add or subtract or modify the content. So it really is kind of an enhancement of your digital world. And there's a number of use cases uh, for an enterprise to consumer that augmented reality can fulfill. So I remember seeing some of the Magic Leap commercials from the very beginning and the way it was portrayed. Now, I've actually never used one, so you know I apologize. <laughs> but I remember seeing like ultra detailed visualizations. If I'm not mistaken, there's the famous one of like the gym, the kids are in the gym and the whale appears and dives into the gym floor, which then splashes water. It was very, very crisp. Tell us about the ethos. Like, why did why go down this path? And I know Magic Leap had a major pivot. You guys talked about it early in the summer to go more enterprise. You know, when it started, was it supposed to be more of a consumer application? You know, give us an idea of like the kind of history of Magic Leap and how, how it got to where it is today. Yeah, it, it was definitely tuned toward the consumer market originally. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, that the consumer market is a great way to show off the capabilities. You talked about you know, the big uh, whale that came, came down and splashed the kids sitting in the, in the gym. And that is a way to 
very strong visualization, yeah. understand what augmented reality is. You know, you're sitting in a gym, you're looking at kid next to you, and all of a sudden a whale comes out of the floor. <laughs> and that's right there shows you sort of the potential of it. I think that the issue, if you will, is there, it was early days, like any technology in early days, the product is rather expensive, you know, before the silicon integrates and the parts get smaller and all of that. And so it was, it was fairly expensive for a consumer product and there simply wasn't enough content. And over time we did pivot toward enterprise and that was absolutely the right move because there's very real use cases right here, right now with Magic Leap 1. And those will be enhanced even further when we come out with our next generation product, Magic Leap 2. But that, to me, just going back to my roots, I was in the uh, mobile phone industry for years. I was at Qualcomm for years. And it's kind of a very similar trajectory to mobile phones. They started big. Um, you know, Michael Douglas had had that big one in, in a movie <laughs> years ago, and it was so cool back then. But, you know, the, the use case was you could make a call from anywhere. And enterprise was largely the, the initial buyers of that product because there was an ROI. You know, our salespeople could make calls from their cars rather than, you know, finding a parking spot and a phone booth. And so we'll see a very similar trajectory with augmented reality. The use cases will really resonate first with enterprise and over time, they'll, uh, they'll flow into the consumer market, which will be the bigger market over time. Yeah. I mean, that makes total sense. When I think about augmented reality, my mind from what, and this guy also showcases what I tend to read, uh, but my mind immediately goes to like the practical use case applications of like training, training things that are otherwise very difficult to simulate. So medicine, you can train, you could simulate just about anything in digital form, right? Whereas a doctor might, you know, you only have so many cadavers or whatever you could work on. Uh, So you could work on it over and over again, Um, training for skills. I mean, arguably flight simulators are already augmented reality, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's part the actual controls of the jet and it's part visualized, you're flying it. Give us an idea of what this new level of Magic Leap AR is kind of unlocking for for the enterprise, like what is it able to do that maybe existing previous technologies weren't quite able to, quite able to like simulate, if you will? Yeah. So I think in the same way that you know we we run back to our desktop or we look at our phone and we ask questions all day long, we're searching things, you know, getting answers. The the ease of that will be how we view augmented reality. In that you'll be able to you know, do your job in your physical world, but it'll be augmented with this digital content that maybe previously you would have had to find your phone or or run over to a PC and there it'll just be right in front of your eyes. So you talked about training. Uh, We have a a partner in Farmers Insurance that worked with one of our ISV partners, Tailspin, and they built a whole training app actually during COVID because they couldn't gather their their new employees together. Mm -hmm. So they brought them together in this augmented world from wherever they were, and they could all train uh, together to, uh, you know, on the same digital image that was sitting maybe in some people's kitchen and other people's living room, but they're able to uh, look at the, the thing that they were being trained on. And just the fact that they didn't have to fly people in and put them up in a say a hotel for three weeks of training in a classroom somewhere, there's a lot of cost savings there. So so first and foremost, I think we're going to realize cost savings in just the reduction of gathering people. You know, they don't have to get on planes. They don't have to be put up in hotels, that sort of thing. And then, you know, the other areas where we're seeing a lot of strong use cases are things like surgery that you mentioned, you know, a cadaver I am not a medical student, but I think those can only be used a few times. You can only use it one and, time. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe just once. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think you can use it more than once. Well, you can't perform the same procedure more than once. <laughs> right. Especially exactly. if the student before you sucked. Like <laughs> now, now you really now you really gotta get another one. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> the, the the beauty of augmented reality is a little bit like Khan Academy. Remember when Khan Academy first came out? You know, if you were trying to understand some complex, uh, you know, differential equations, you could go to Khan Academy and play the the session over and over and over again. And 
And that helps people, right? Uh, you, in a classroom, you hear the teacher say it once, but you can, if you can reinforce with replaying things, it just really reinforces your ability to understand a concept. And that is what we're seeing with pre-surgical planning, uh, surgical training. You can, you know, you can look at a human form and on top of it, you can overlay digital content. So, so for instance, we have a partner of ours right now, you actually using it to do pre-surgical planning. So they've taken uh, what used to be, you know, a 2D depiction of a CAT scan of a brain, and they turned it into a 3D image, initially just on PCs, but now with Magic Leap, they built it onto our platform and you can actually see a brain in the middle of your room and you can walk around it. You can map out the surgical pathways that the surgeon needs to take. And then when the surgeon goes into surgery, they can see that digital line overlaid onto the patient's brain. That's got to be immensely precise. That's exactly. This is a highly pre a brain surgery. <laughs> Let's move back up one second. <laughs> this is ultra precise. Like, and, and we just talked about like, you don't get redos. Like you can't cut up someone's brain and be like, oh, let me fix it. <laughs> let me undo that. So how, like, give us the level of precision that the, the, the AR is like, I mean, it's got to be exact. Like I, I can't, Oh, There's yeah. no other way to describe it. Like we're over time, we're shooting towards submillimeter precision. But mm. even now, just the pre-surgical planning, if you can imagine, like we were involved with the separation of uh, twin babies' brains. They were conjoined at the brains. Wow. It was uh, last October. And we worked with UC Davis, who did the uh, separation, and Brain Lab, our partner, uh, who had all the the 3D imaging and the, and based on their mixed reality viewer, they trained the entire surgical team, about 30 person surgical team, to separate wow. uh, to do a separation surgery like that. It's pretty complex, and they trained them for months using the Magic Leap device. So everybody knew exactly what was going to happen, exactly what would happen, you know, after the first incisions, and then when the babies were separated and what to do after that. And I, you know, I feel like it's such a tool for surgeons that at some point we'll look back and say, do you remember when surgeons, you know, just used to freehand it <laughs> and now they have yeah. digital, you know, markers to help them through the surgery that are very, very accurate. And I think, you know, we'll say, wow, we used to have surgeries, you know, without any digital content overlaid. I do believe we'll reach that day. You know, you, you hit on the great thing, which is expertise usually just is is really like Malcolm Gladwell it's through repetition and if you have an ability to kind con constantly repeat the task without consequence then you have to i mean by default you will be better at it like that's i've yet to meet like i have kids i tell them all the time if you keep playing guitar i'm not saying you're going to be Jimi Hendrix but you're going to be better than you were <laughs> yesterday like that's a that's a fact exactly right and everyone can get better and so this concept is is so cool, in my opinion, of the of the different occupations it can be a part of. You mentioned earlier this concept of content and how in the early days there wasn't enough content to support the hardware or vice versa. And I was thinking to myself, like, what's a good analogy of this? And a good analogy of this is actually, you remember the craze of 3D TV? There was gonna be 3D TV, but then there wasn't enough 3D content. So then yeah. people had 3D TVs that did nothing. And then everyone kind of gave up on 3D TV that just by, by the wayside. How do you encourage people to create content for you? Because you just hinted at it as well. Like these partners have to also create it. And I guess, does Magic Leap actively build like what Epic Games does with Unreal Engine like or Apple with uh, iOS language? Like, are you actively building the language that makes it easier for third parties to create content for, for the hardware? Up to a certain point. Gotcha. I, and I will say when we started, we built the entire stack. You know, we, were, we worked with our chipset vendor, on, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, capability that needed to be part of the chipset because AR was new and we didn't have that capability built into any existing chipset. So we, we did that. We, um, we built an operating system. We then built some of the in early initial content and we built the hardware itself. So, you know, I think looking back on that, some people might have said, well, that was a phenomenal undertaking to do top to bottom. But if you if you look at just about any technology that was really groundbreaking, they did the same thing. They built top to bottom because 
Otherwise, it's just a, a PowerPoint deck, right? And you say, this is my vision and, you know, it, it can work. But until somebody does it, it's not working. And, you know, you could imagine Magic Leap, the small company, having to go to the big operating system companies and say, hey, can you make this little tweak for augmented reality? Yeah. I, you know, I need to build these 3D maps. Can you make this tweak? And, you know, they would have put it on their list and they would have gotten to it when they got to it. So instead of being dependent upon the operating systems that were available at the time, we chose to build our own operating system. And it was, it was the, definitely the right thing to do. And we're, we're broadening that now and incorporating more of an Android base. But initially, that was the right thing to do. We wouldn't have seen the technology. We wouldn't have been able to do what we did in the amount of time that we had. So it was, it was definitely a big undertaking, but it was the right undertaking at the time. Yeah, that story seems similar to what I read about, and, and I might botch some of the details, but like when Pixar first approached Steve Jobs with their Pixar technology, and they're like, okay, but this is still not a good movie. It's just a nice picture. Like you need a, you need storytellers so that people understand what this technology is. Yeah. And that's what he, uh, that's what he pushed them down the path. I saw a documentary, like you have to be able to bring it to life. And you guys did that from the very beginning. There was a lot of buzz about Magic Leap and what it could unlock. I remember there was a lot of, cons that's the, the consumer buzz. So it's really cool to hear that it is now more of an enterprise application. Give us an idea of where your energy is going to focus in the next few years. Is it going to be on the hardware to make it more affordable? Is it going to be, I mean, is that one aspect of it? Is it in the software side to make it more capable of rendering different things more precisely? Is it going to be recruiting uh, more developers on this platform? Or is it, you know, you're probably going to tell me all three. Uh <laughs> Pretty much all three. <laughs> Give us an idea of how this becomes more commonplace. Yeah. Because it seems like it's got a high utility, but like you said, it, it's got to be more available and there needs to be more content programming for the system for it to be more useful. All of those things. But I would say that, you know, the thread across all of that is we have to prove value for somebody on the other side. Like why would somebody adopt this? And really when it was a consumer, pro more focused on a consumer product, I think a consumer would adopt it because there was great content. There was something that they loved, but there wasn't enough for the momentum to really get going. Right. With the focus on enterprise, and our engagement with the ISV community in the enterprise, that whole ecosystem that enterprises use, we're talking to, you know, the, their existing application vendors who can work with us to really make whatever their application is come to life with the addition of augmented reality. So we have a strong focus on building that ecosystem, which means I've got to have the right APIs and the right access for them and the right SDKs. And so we're building that. And also an enterprise device is very different from a consumer device in that we've got a lot of corporate data on there. And the thing is bristling with cameras. So we need to make sure, you know, they're tracking your eyes. There's a world camera that's, you know, that are, that are looking out at the space around you. We need to make sure that all the data is protected, stays private, stays within the enterprise's wheelhouse so that we aren't, uh, you know, leaking it anywhere or using it for any other purpose, but for that enterprise. And that is something that was a big pivot for us. So we had to add things like mobile device management to the product to make sure that the, you know, the data was protected, that you could download and offload things. Um, so those were some of the bigger things. But then the last was just the device itself. Enterprise want to use this all day, every day. So it has to be lightweight enough to sit on your face for that amount of time. You can't heat up someone's head. <laughs> There's a lot going on in these devices. You know, they're, yeah. they're rendering a lot of images, which causes things to heat up. So we, from the very beginning, separated the compute part of it. And we have it down uh, what we call the light pack uh, that sits on, you know, it could hook onto your pocket or it could sit on your uh, waistband or your belt. And that takes the heat and a lot of the weight off of your head. And with Magic Leap 2, we, we're refining that even more. We're making the product smaller, um, lighter weight. Um, and then probably the biggest thing we're doing is expanding what's known as the field of view, which is sort of the canvas that you can paint your digital imagery on. And obviously, a small field of view isn't great. Yeah. You could, if you can, only <laughs> you can only augment a small part of my physical world, that's limiting. It might be okay for some apps. For some use cases, 
but it's limiting for enterprise. And so we have uh, doubled the field of view from between Magic Leap 1 to Magic Leap 2. And we're really excited about that. Uh, we think that a little bit of a lot of enterprise use cases. Yeah, field of view is one of the more challenging ones, I would assume, because I, I think to all the different goggle systems or first person video games I've ever played, like nothing actually looks like the real world. The real world, we all know this, but for anyone in our audience has never really thought about it, your eyeballs can literally see directly to the sides. Like your, your field of view is, is just unbelievable. I can't describe it. It's like if you put your hands straight out to the sides, you can see your hands. If you were to really think about it, you could probably see like the, the butts of your cheek right down to the floor. It's pretty crazy. You know, you're trying to do a lot of different things with Magic Leap. You're building innovative products. So how does the supply chain almost like catch up to you? Like, right. So there's, you're constantly in this place where it's like, I don't have good enough chips or I don't have light enough plastics or I don't have good enough camera lenses, whatever the things are. If you're being super innovative, you have to be thinking like, do I wait for my suppliers to get there and push my suppliers? Like, Hey, I need this. Or you just make it yourself. Talk about that because you are doing things that haven't been done before. Therefore, there's probably not really parts for it. Like, <laughs> You're so right. It was challenging along the way. And um, I will say we have a great set of vendors who have been working with us. But remember, Magic Leap's been around over 10 years yeah. and they've been innovating a long time. So they've been introducing the concepts to the supply chain for a number of years. And so when we ramped up for Magic Leap 1, our vendors, our partners, really, they were, they were right there with us, uh, stepped up. But it's complex technology. It's, it's really an optical problem set. So you're tricking your eye into thinking that there's a piece of digital content sitting on my desk right here or yeah. sitting across the way or out my window. Your eye looks over there and that digital content is stuck right there. Like it it knows where your world's at. We know where your world's at. We know how to place it. We know how to make it stick. But that is a, a very, very hard optical challenge. And I would say the Magic Leap team is awesome. There's, you know, they are of the highest quality optical engineers, power management engineers, uh, silicon experts. They have done, as you said, Albert, something that no one had done before. And really a plus is that we had our own factory. Mm. We're based in South Florida. We were probably the, one of the first tech companies in South Florida. It's kind of, sort of booming now for tech these days, which yeah. we love. It's great to have that ecosystem around us. But we were, we were a, a party of one for a long time there. But they had the good fortune of um, moving into an old Motorola uh, mobile phone factory. Mm. And so it was, it was at least outfitted enough where we, it was a good start. But then along the way, things like um, when we wanted to test the optical resolution of the unit, there were no calibration machines to do it. So the teams built the calibration machines. It was, it's awesome. If you get a chance, and would love for you to come to South Florida and visit the factory to see what this team did. They just created things that had never been done before because they had to. You know, they were so ahead of the curve. They had to just come up with it themselves. And again, worked with a lot of partners who helped us sort of co-develop the machines and get them online enough to launch a commercial version of augmented reality, which we did with Magic Leap One. Yeah, and along the way, you know, the challenge of building, innovating this, the thing that is unique about, I feel like with Magic Leap is that you hinted at it. It's you have to convince the eyeball, which is another problem, right? So even if you've got all the technology, right? Then you'd be like, how do you test that? I, the only way I can understand testing is actually guess and check, which is not a good way to do things. But I'm imagining you think you have it right. It's all in computer program. You put the headset on, then you're like, my eyes don't see it or my eyes don't see it properly. Like it's not clear or it's off. We all know that just not being clear makes it useless, right? Like if my eyes can't see it and then we have different people with different vision and eyesight. Give us an idea of how the challenge of what existed to make it this, like basically, like you said, like the eye, you were convincing the eyeball that there's a digital piece of content right there. Talk about the the challenge of making that true. Yeah, and I'm probably not the best ones. One of our optical engineers could go <laughs> much more in depth, but um, we have a diffractive waveguide that was necessary in order for the eye again to believe that at a certain position in my physical world there was a piece of digital content sitting there. Mm -hmm. And I should probably start by saying. 
we are not just a heads up display. So a heads up display is you put on some goggles, you see the content, but it sticks, you know, it's, it's always in the same place. You move your head and it moves with you. And this is where we actually place the digital content in your physical world and it doesn't move around. You move your head, you move back, that content is still there. Mm. And by the way, if you jump up and down, that content shouldn't move, right? Because it's not jumping up and down. So it all has to be as if your eye is actually seeing that. And I would say there's just a handful of companies that are operating in that category. Obviously, uh, my old company, Microsoft, makes a great product in HoloLens. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you can think of it as as really quality, high-end augmented reality. Because all those little things that you that you talked about, sort of any fuzziness or you know, any jittering can make you ill actually yeah. and it's you know I mean, vr in and of itself has a bit of that problem when you're fully occluded yeah. and you kind of lose your sense of balance there's all those videos of people falling all over the place uh wearing <laughs> yeah. vr sets my son included i have a video of him like he's playing a video game something came around the corner and scared him and he fell right to the ground <laughs> yeah it's like it happens and i actually am one of the People, there's you know a certain percentage of the population when they wear VR get nauseous, and I can't wear it for very long. And so clearly, as an enterprise device that you want to wear all day, right. you can't have that. Right. <laughs> so the the engineers have done a lot of just amazing science in this field, and again, they've had years to perfect it and and have done a great job. They've got tons of IP in this area that just makes your eye believe and does not make you feel ill because it's not bouncing around. It's not moving. It's where your eye thinks it is. And it stays right there. So, you know, you mentioned just a moment ago that you, you came from Microsoft. When did you first try the product and where you're like, oh, this is something different? Because, you know, I'd love to hear your like first experience. When did you first experience Magic Leap? Yeah, so I knew the previous CEO, Roni Abovitz, who's just a wonderful visionary. And we used to meet up at various tech conferences. And one day he said, hey, do you want to come see it? I think it was, uh, I think it was just before the launch because they launched Magically Born in 2018 in August. And it was sometime earlier that year. I came out to South Florida and I got to experience it. And, yeah. you know, you might wonder, well, why would someone reach out you know, when you're, you have a competitive product, we did have competing products because I was at Microsoft, we had HoloLens and they had Magic Leap One, but we were very much in sync as far as the industry, the broader augmented reality industry. We wanted to ensure that we were working together on industry standards and the protocols and things like that. Mm. We didn't want to impede each other's ability to, you know, to make an augmented reality industry. And so I went out and I was blown away. I, I and, and I also got that factory tour that I, a few people have told me about that really blew them away too, because they were doing things there in that factory that no one had ever done. Like they were building these devices that no one had ever built. To me, it was as awe-inspiring as when I first was working in the mobile phone industry and, and started to use the first mobile phones. Uh, you know, it, it was kind of amazing that yeah. you could walk outside and you could make a phone call. Like, wow, that was like, so cool. And it had that, say, I had that same feeling. It was, this is something special. So I knew the technology before I took the job. I knew it was solid. And, you know, that was part of my reasoning to come to the company. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, the way you described it, I'm thinking about the time. This was when I was in high school, the people had pagers. <laughs> yeah. And I remember the first time I saw a cell phone, I was like, what do you mean you can call someone? It's like, yeah, you can just call someone. Because prior to that, this is in the 90s, what you said, like the Motorola cell phones, like the Zach Morris cell phones, they were huge. They were absolute bricks that came with like their own station. Like it, it was, it was actually corded. It was corded to like a station that you could transport. Then they eventually got to the Zach Moore Saved by the Bell giant brick phones. You know what I'm talking about? They're yes. the like, equivalent the size of your head. They had those. And then I remember the first time someone pulled out a pocket cell, same, same concepts. Like, what do you mean? Like, how can it be so small? Like it, it just boggled your mind. Like, uh, this is not possible. You know, 
the way you describe it is exactly how I would envision like seeing something brand new for the first time. Your mind probably start thinking of all the use cases and applications. Talk a little bit about your background because you had been in business development. It looks like for quite a while. For my, you know, you know, if anyone wants to look up on LinkedIn, they'll be able to know how long I won't date you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> yeah, at Qualcomm, Microsoft, yeah. you're doing a lot of business development, but your background is actually in electrical engineering. So talk a little bit about that because your career path is pretty fascinating. You start as off as an engineer. You're clearly, you know, global market. I'm reading your titles: global market development. EVP business development. That means you know how to sell some stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> talk about how that transition happened for you from engineering to business development. And then, you know, obviously you got a chance to meet the, the team, see the product and open your eyes to like the opportunities at Magic Leap. Sure. Yeah. So I was an engineer and um, loved it. And really my move over to the business side was uh, initiated when I started to go along on business trips um, back at, in, my call, in the Qualcomm days, uh, we built a two-way satellite modem that went on long haul trucks. And they would bring me along to translate what the, this modem did to the trucking companies. And I loved it. I loved talking about a real complex device, but translating it so that they could understand how it could be useful to them. And this, you know, this product was in use before mobile phones, you know, covered the nation. So there wasn't any coverage out on most highways where long haul trucks would travel. And with the product, we could, you know, the trucking companies could now talk to their drivers and reroute them or have them pick up an extra load where before they would be out of contact, sometimes for 24, 48 hours, they just didn't know where the truck was. So now we could track them and all that. So it was really in one of the early mobile networks. And um and I found that I just sort of came alive when I was in front of the customer. I loved it. Like I was super excited when I had the opportunity to go on those trips. And at some point I just said, why don't I just do what I love? I loved engineering, but I, I really was passionate about getting in front of the customer and, and being able to translate these technical products that we had. And so eventually I moved over to the business side and um, kind of worked my way up at Qualcomm, was running BizDev there when uh, Microsoft reached out uh, with a similar role to run BizDev at Microsoft. And, and that was kind of a new level altogether because Qualcomm was, you know, the mobile wireless world generally, you know, we made chips, but Microsoft was like massive. They have, yeah. you know, so many businesses and yeah. the job was you're running business development for the entire company. <laughs> so that was, <laughs> you know, I had to quickly get up to speed on cloud, on gaming, on our office. And, and uh, it, was, it was just a wonderful opportunity uh, to get to, you know, to work for Satya Nadella and to be able to learn so many different businesses. And obviously one of them was HoloLens. And I was, I was fascinated by AR because even back in my Qualcomm days, we had a program called Vuforia that did augmented reality on mobile phones, kind of Pokemon Go style, mm -hmm. right? You hold it up and you see some digital content. So I was always fascinated by where augmented reality could go, the vision of it back then. And then uh, HoloLens took it to a new level. And then getting to see Magic Leap, I thought, wow, this is, this is the future. I mean, there will be a time again, we'll go look back and say, remember when we didn't have digital augmentation in front of our eyes and, you know, whether that'll be in the form of glasses that we'll wear or contacts, maybe at some point, I do believe we will have that kind of capability as a tool to help us just get through our days, do our jobs, um, and to entertain us. And uh, this is the start of it. So, What's so exciting about it is it feels like the start of the mobile phone industry, you know, which like, where could this go? And look where it's gone. It's amazing. We have computers in our pocket. And I feel that same energy around augmented reality. So your years of business development now have to be serving you extremely well, because now let's fast forward. We're now back to your present day. One of the biggest challenges of big forward leaping innovations is most people you encounter actually are quite resistant. A lot of people are resistant. They'll be like, well, I don't need this. So how are you balancing this? Because you need customers, of course, to embrace this technology. So I'm, I'm assuming you're quite doing quite a bit of customer education, right? 
to demonstrate the capabilities, but you also have to plan a story and a seed in their head that they can leverage this because there are, you know, the reality is there's a lot of people that are resistant to new innovation. They just don't want to take on the new thing because they feel like it's not developed enough, it's not accurate enough, or whatever their whatever their resistance is. I'm assuming there's quite a bit of customer education going in your role right now to say like, hey, this is what it can unlock for you. Yeah, there there is. And you know, for me, it's a lot like cloud. So I was at Microsoft in the early days of- Why would I build in the cloud? <laughs> yeah. Why would I do that? I got a bunch of- I got a data center. <laughs> I got a bunch of computers right in my backyard. I don't need that cloud stuff. And <laughs> that is, it's, it feels the same. That education process feels the same, but you know, it's incumbent upon, it was incumbent upon Microsoft at the time to show the value of the cloud. It's incumbent upon me to show the value of augmented reality. So what we look for are companies that are comfortable, you know, ideating in new fields. And those are the companies that we're working with. They, they want to understand it. They want to understand how it could help their business. They're not playing, right? They want, they want a productivity improvement. They want some cost improvement. Mm -hmm. They want a time resolution improvement. And so we're working with companies that will put in the time on the other side to work with our engineering teams to come up with these use cases. And, you know, the, those are the companies that fall into that more innovative category. You know, you've got the, the ones who are going to fall into the innovator's dilemma, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to keep doing their same thing they always do. You know, new technology, I don't want to hear about it. And then there's <laughs> the ones who are seeking out, the ones that will spend time and cycles on a new technology uh, to see what it can do for them. And, you know, it's interesting, Forrester has, they have a chart, like companies that were the top 20 companies back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and then the ones today. And there's like very few that are yeah. uh, actually micro, Microsoft's one of them. They've been on, you know, the whole time. They've, they have continued to innovate, particularly under Satya. And if you don't look at these new technologies, you're just going to get left behind. So it takes cycles. It takes some energy. But the ones who adopt it are the ones who have the staying power. Yeah. Not everyone can run a company like Tabasco Sauce. I don't think I don't think they've introduced a new flavor. <laughs> <laughs> not everyone can have one of those, right? That is a recipe you don't want to touch. <laughs> That's a good recipe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They they definitely innovate though, probably on supply chain, manufacturing, production. But as far as like product innovation, like you know, I think they make the jar bigger and they make it smaller, and that's <laughs> <laughs> that's it done. <laughs> you know, when you think about this new technology and you're talking about the level of education, you're working with customers that really want to innovate and be on the bleeding side of innovation. Give us an idea of how, like, what's the growth of interest in this type of technology? Yeah, because certainly when you first started, I don't know, probably a handful of people called Magic Leap. Now more people. Give us an idea of like, what is the demand curve looking like in regards to people that think, hey, I want to reach out to Magic Leap because I think one of these solutions could potentially change, augment my business for the better. I feel like that curve's probably, that, that's probably ascending, but you know. Yeah, I think the, the best thing that I've seen that really explains it, third party, not just from me, is from IDC. They, they looked at the AR, VR industry broadly across consumer and enterprise. And, you know, the market is, is there now, but it's growing. They, IDC says it'll be about $140 billion market by 2024, all up across all of those different vectors. But enterprise AR, which is the area that we play in at Magic Leap, is the one that's growing earliest because of the things I talked about. You know, consumers need small, light, inexpensive. But if you can prove an ROI for a company they're a lot more fungible on the cost of the product if you've got some ROI on the backside. So right. that's where we're focused. And that market is about a quarter of that. It's about 36 billion by 2024. Mm. Now, longer term, it'll be just much like mobile phones. The consumer market obviously is much bigger and broader, but we got to get there. And, we've, and we'll get there with further innovation and making things smaller, lighter, more silicon integration. Mm -hmm and eventually get to that size that you hear folks like Mark Zuckerberg talk about, you know, the glasses, they want to see glasses, not, you know, a large headset. headsets. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's what we're all aiming toward, but you've got to get there along the way. It's, it's, you, it's really hard to jump from here all the way to there without going through those iterative processes to get the technology down to the form that's useful for the consumer. Peggy, couldn't agree with you more. 
I want to thank you for joining us today on IT Visionaries. But before you go, it is time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to you by the Salesforce platform, the number one platform for digital transformation of every experience. Peggy, this is where we ask you questions outside of the realm of work so our audience can get to know you a little bit better. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, here we go. Listen, your Twitter bio, we already hit at it. It's, it's full of information. It's great. Um, four dogs, three kids, two cats. Why that order? And one husband. <laughs> <laughs> do you like your dogs more than your kids? Do you like your kids more than your cats? And do you like all three more than your husband? I just like the linear similarity of that. <laughs> Being an, an engineering background, <laughs> no, definitely. Uh, uh, I have to put the the kids and the husband up a little bit higher than the dogs and cats, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Only sometimes. Listen, I like my. I got three kids myself, and sometimes I like my dog more. So you know, I think every parent's been there, right? <laughs> exactly. So you are from San Diego, is that right? I'm from LA, but grew up in San Diego mostly. Yeah. Gotcha. Are you a big baseball fan? Because we saw that you have, uh, you seem to like tweet some baseball highlights. Yeah. So it's, there's been ups and downs to the Padres season, <laughs> but I love baseball. Yeah. It's been fun this year. You know, it might not be our year, but it's been much funner than past Padres seasons. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Makes total sense. You know, are you more, so one of the things you've identified, so we've identified baseball, you like running, you love your family. What else do you like to do when you are not, you know, changing the world of augmented reality? I like to read, I guess. Yeah, that's a, a big one for me and um, fiction and nonfiction. So that's probably what, where you'll find me if I'm not doing one of those other things. Give us a recommendation of something you read recently where you're like, wow, this was really good. Oh, I just read a book called American Civility. It's a, it's a fiction book kind of set in 1930s America. And it was great. It was wonderful. Just a fun book, but it was fun. And I liked it. More than a beach read. It was more in depth than a beach read. I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. So this kind of blends work and regular life. So Forget augmented reality for a second. What's one piece of technology coming out in the future or like that you see people developing towards that you're really excited about? I think quantum computing, that's going to be awesome. I mean, when, when we're able to crack, you know, the manufacturer of those devices, the amount of processing that a quantum computer can do is going to solve some really big problems uh, that we have, you know, it, rather than running on a computer for years, you could actually run in minutes, you know, what might've taken years on a traditional PC. So that's an exciting technology. Hopefully we'll see more of in the next five years or so. You see, I think that was also going to help you with magically because the amount of information you'll be able to process is going to be <laughs> <laughs> a lot. We're going to need it. <laughs> Well, Peggy, I want to say thank you for joining us today on IT Visionaries. Thanks for sharing some of the things you're up to at Magic Leap. You know, really appreciate you identifying some of the use cases. So, because I think a lot of our audience, some of our audience might be more on the consumer side. So it's tough for them to understand, like, well, what's, what's this used for, for you to practically explain this? I love the brain surgery path example you gave and how precise it has to be because I can easily see, I think most people hearing that example will easily be able to tell like how much better it can possibly make specific fields, right? The medical field just being one of them. So thank you for sharing all those stories. Thanks, Albert. It's been a real pleasure.